بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Through the previous programs we talked about the suffering that the Muslims faced in the early stages of Islam. Unfortunately, this suffering reached to a limit that there had to be a way out because the pagans could not have it their way with the Muslims and the Muslims would not be able to practice the religion in peace. So something had to take place. At that stage, our Prophet وسلم, instructed his companions to migrate to another country in another continent, simply to worship Allah alone and to be free to do that. And it's not a very difficult thing to do. Muslims believe that freedom of religion, freedom of belief, should be secured for all. And this is exactly what was manifested by the Prophet ﷺ when he went to Medina. He allowed the Jews, the Christians, to worship as they pleased. This is their faith, this is their religion, and they had all the, all the right to do so. Muslims at the time of the pagans wanted the same thing, but yet they were deprived from having it. And that, is, well, that was why the Prophet ﷺ told them to migrate to Abyssinia, which was to the coast of Arabia, west of Arabia, and they had to sail there. And at the beginning, only a small group of Muslims went there. There were 12 men with four women. Of course, mm. these four women had their husbands among the 12 men, so they had their mahram. No one was traveling without a mahram. Mm. Sheikh, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, why uh, to this to this country, country specifically? Okay, you want to give me the second question or should and, I answer and, this first? And the second question, uh, why in this time, not before or after? Okay. Firstly, the Prophet ﷺ knew exactly what was going on around him, which also indicates and teaches us that a Muslim should be aware of what's happening around him. Yeah. It is not enough for a Muslim to sit idly, not knowing about the events that are taking place around him. A Muslim, it's not a must, but it is. it Preferable. adds a lot of value. Yeah. Preferable. Yes, it adds a lot of value when I talk to non-Muslims and tell them that I know what is happening in, the, in, in their countries. I know about what FEMA did with, with uh, the hurricane and what uh, this country <laughs> did with that. I have knowledge about it. It adds value to know. And it is appealing to them that I know things about them. The Prophet ﷺ had great knowledge of what's going on around him, though he was illiterate. He told them, go to Abyssinia, and he justified this by saying, there is a ruler that people are not treated unjustly in his presence. So, if you go there, no one can harm you or stop you from worshipping Allah because the king is fair and just. They took a boat and they went there. Uh, as for your second question, why this timing? Yes. It is something that is from uh, Allah. Did Allah order? Well, we, we don't, of course, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does not do anything without the orders of Allah. And we believe that the Muslims tolerated enough to the extent that they've reached their peak. So they had to depressurize what was happening to them. Okay, Sheikh. The Prophet Sallallahu was tortured and was persecuted like them. Why didn't he migrate with them? Why didn't he migrate like them? As we said earlier, the Prophet Sallallahu 
was not punished and tortured like they were, were uh, tortured. The Prophet ﷺ had his tribe, had Abu Talib to protect him. The worst that they done to him was, for example, once he was prostrating, praying in the, in, in the masjid, in the Kaaba. Yes. He was prostrate, prostrating. So a group of pagans said, okay, who among you would go to the house of so-and-so who slaughtered a camel this morning and come to the intestines of the camel, to the guts and the filth, and bring it and put it on top of his back while he's prostrating. And Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it, the worst of them all, went and brought this. And while the Prophet was prostrating Asab, he put it on his back. The Prophet did not move. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was praying for Allah Azza wa Jal. Now imagine this filth and dirt on your back. And for what? What was your crime? Nothing. Nothing. You're just praying for Allah Azza wa Is this a crime that you should punish me for? And is this what our brothers facing from the superpowers because they say La ilaha illallah? What did the people in Muslim countries that have been oppressed, attacked, what's their crime? Their only crime is that they are Muslims. Yeah. The Prophet did not move <laughs> until someone, and that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in some narrations, went and the Muslims did not move because anyone would have, that, that would have moved would have been killed instantly. You cannot play with, they're not the mafia, they're even worse, you know, they are tyrants, they are strong people that have no compromise, no heart, no feelings. Abdullah bin Mas'ud went to Fatima, who was a child of six or seven years old, and told her about what's happening. She came immediately, very young little child, cleaned the back of her father so that to allow him to raise his head, and then looked at them and started swearing at them one by one. This little child, this brave little child. And the minute the Prophet ﷺ concluded his prayer, he stood up and he raised his hands and he started praying to Allah Azza wa Jal in a loud voice. And the pagans, though, were, though they were pagans, they hated anyone praying to Allah Azza wa Jal because they knew if it were, was in haram and he is praying to Allah that Allah will answer. He, he was praying against them. I'll tell you what he said. Yeah. He raised his hands and said, Oh Allah, you are my protector. I, I want you, I pray to you that you take care of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayb ibn Rabi'ah, Al -al Amr ibn Hisham, uh, Al Walid ibn Al Maghira, Ubay ibn, uh, Ubay ibn Khalaf. And he started naming people by name. Oh. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was present at the time, said, By Allah. I've seen each and every one that the Prophet ﷺ prayed uh, against. To what I say, I saw everyone that he prayed against killed on the battle of Badr, and they are the people that the Prophet ﷺ asked his companions to throw their bodies in a well and bury them. And he spoke to them after being killed in battle. He told them, "We have." found and uh, uh, seen what Allah has promised us. Have you seen what Allah promised you? And Umar came to him and said, Prophet of Allah, they're dead. How are you you're talking to dead people? He said, Umar, I know they're dead, but Allah Azza wa Jal made them hear yeah. what I see, what, what I say as form of punishment. This was one form of punishment that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or torture uh, uh, faced. The other one was when some of the mushrik, it was said, Aqba ibn Abi Ma'it and some say uh, Abu Jahl came and grabbed the Prophet ﷺ by the neck and was pulling him and telling him stop whatever you're doing this don't do this don't call people to Islam and the only one who came to defend him was Abu Bakr saying that come on people do you want to kill 
a man simply just because he says La ilaha illallah and they let him go. The Prophet was, uh, 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 they, they tried to make life difficult for him in the sense that they would put obstacles in his way. He would go out of his house and find trash in front of his house and he would say, come on people of Quraysh, is this a way of living? What are you doing? Is this a way to treat your neighbor? Yeah. And he would remove it and the following day he would find it. He was not physically abused, in the sense Salam. that nobody hit him. Although they wanted to, but they couldn't. There were so many incidents that Abu Jahl went to beat him with his sword, with his bow, and whenever he wanted to do this, something would come up and prevent him. In so many cases, they told him, uh, oh, you wanted to beat the Prophet Sallallahu why didn't you do that? He said, by God, I couldn't. There was this big camel opening his mouth. If I just got close, he would have got my head off. Yeah. And no, nothing was there. And the Prophet told him that this was an angel ready to attack him the minute he moves. Yeah. And in one incident, he also wanted to attack the Prophet ﷺ, yeah. and then yeah. Allah sent fire to him and he had to stay away. And the comp his companions looked at him and laughed and said, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you, what are you running off? He said, there is a huge fire. And this was made by Allah Azza wa Jal to protect his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So, Sheikh, also I think that uh, <coughs> Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like the rest of the prophets and messengers, we mm. peace and blessings be upon them all, uh, can never migrate without Allah's permission. Leave. Yes, th this is true, but again... Don't be like John. No, no, no. This is uh, 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 true that he cannot do anything without the permission of Allah. Azzawajal, but also the companions did not do anything without the permission of the Prophet. Yeah. So he allowed them to go, which means that if Allah Azzawajal allowed them to go, he would have went. Especially but, to leave. Yes, oh. but imagine what ha would happen if the Prophet left alayhi salam, salam. and all the Muslims are stranded behind him that wouldn't be fair and that is why the Prophet ﷺ was among the very last to migrate to Medina after all his companions has had gone and uh, uh, formulated a Muslim uh, uh, nation I think we have a short break so stay tuned and inshallah we will be right back If you're 18 or if you're 80, if you've been Muslim for 50 years or five minutes, this is a show for you. You know, when five times a day I've, our foreheads touch the ground in prayer, we beg for what's most important in our lives. We want to be good people, better Muslims. We want to serve Allah Almighty with all our hearts. In the show, Let's Talk, every week we're going to talk about Islam and life, how to relate with other people and how to serve Allah. We'll have studio guests, we'll have a live studio audience. There'll be a, an email for you to write to, talk at huda.tv. So if you're looking for something different, looking for something that will make you think, maybe even touch your heart, this is the show for you. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. The first migration took place on the fifth year of the beginning of Islam. And it was 12 men plus four women mm -hmm. who migrated. They went to the coast of uh, uh, the Red Sea yeah. and got a boat for half a dinar that took them to the other coast and they lived for a very short period of time in Abyssinia, in Africa. Yeah. And no one ever talked to them or asked them to do something they didn't want to do. To their astonishment, they heard that the pagans were in a truce with the Muslims. And they've allowed the Muslims to worship Allah freely. And so they believed what they had heard 
and they went back to Mecca to find out that all what they have heard was a bunch of lies. And this teaches us that gossips are forbidden in Islam because they have more harm than good. Yes. It also teaches us that our responsibilities as Muslims are not to spread whatever we hear and not to be a relay station collecting all the data and sending it back again without filtering it. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about the pagans who said that the angels are the daughters of Allah. So they made the angels daughters, females of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah says in the Holy Quran, had they witnessed their creation? Oh, you pagans, did you see me create them angels so that you can claim that they are uh, uh, females? By Allah, your witness or your testimony will be written down and on the day of judgment, each one of you will be asked. This is a very strong message from the Holy Quran that teaches us never ever relay whatever you hear without authenticating it. It's not enough to say it's hearsay. I heard someone say blah, 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 and I'm just conveying what I heard. Yeah. This is unacceptable in Islam. You are part of the process. If it's a lie, you are a liar, and you will be punished on the Day of Judgment. If it's true, then th there's no harm done. But the majority, majority speaking, in the, ma in, the, in the majority of cases, people just relay whatever they hear and this by itself is a burden by the way one one doesn't carry the message as it is definitely add some little words this uh, is true but bit by bit that, yeah. bit by bit everyone by transforming it or or, or, or t saying it to someone he adds few spices to it and him yeah. and this other one giving it to a third one they put some salt to it the third one gives it to the fourth put some uh, 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 sauce to it, and then it's a whole new recipe. Yeah. The Muslims who were in Abyssinia went back to find out that it was not as True. they heard. Yeah. Okay, so, Sheikh, I have a question about immigration. <clears throat> if, if, uh, if I'm a Muslim in a non-Muslim country, I, uh, I feel oppression and depression, and I can establish my religion the, sh the way it should be is it a must on me to migrate to another country to a Muslim country and relocate there stay the, the rest of my life there or what should I do here? the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said after conquering Mecca there is no migration after conquering Mecca this was said to stop people from leaving Mecca to Medina or to leave their cities to Medina after migration as the whole Arabia was under the rule of Islam. So migration is over. But in particular cases, if a person is unable to practice his religion, if he is being oppressed, if he prays, yeah. or if he is being prosecuted, for fasting or for reading the Quran, <clears throat> as was the case in the Soviet blocs uh, 20 or, or more years ago, then the answer would be yes. It is obligatory for him to migrate to a country where he can practice his relig religion freely. It, sh it may not be a, a Muslim country, yeah. as unfortunately the Muslims themselves are getting far away from their religion instead of getting closer because we have these political uh, games going on and one cannot live in a Muslim country freely but sometimes it, it is easier to go to a non-Muslim country and get a citizenship there that rather than in a Muslim country so if this is the case yes you may travel you may uh, 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 immigrate, migrate from that country where you're being oppressed because of your religion 
to another country where you can practice Islam freely. But nowadays I don't see any country where Muslims are under oppression. Under oppression. I, be, I believe that, alhamdulillah, Islam is spread worldwide. Even in Palestine, I ask Allah and pray to Him that it is liberated so that we can all go and pray in Beit uh, 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 al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Even Palestine, people still are able to pray, to fast, to practice their religion with some limitations and with the oppression of the Jews. But, mainly speaking, alhamdulillah, the whole universe, you can practice your religion without being oppressed. Okay, what, what about traveling to a non-Muslim country? Just for trading, for, for, work, another for another purpose other than spreading da'wah or Islam. There is no problem in traveling to other countries, especially to non-Muslim countries, providing that there is a legit legitimate reason behind that, such as trading, seeking knowledge, studying, Even medication. Uh, providing there is a legitimate reason, Second condition, that you have a degree of piety and virtue in you that prevents you from answering the temptations there. Yeah. Because if you don't have this amount of piety uh, 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 and, and, and virtue, you are susceptible to fall into sin. Yes. And the third condition would be that you would have a sufficient amount of knowledge that constitutes a barrier between the bad doubts and thoughts of other religions so you are immune from being affected from these uh, doubts and ideas. With these three conditions fulfilled, scholars say you may travel to work, uh, to live, or to uh, uh, do whatever you want to any non-Muslim country. Yes. Going back to the Hijrah, once the Muslims came back, this meant that they had to go again. Yeah. But the first group were like the scouts for the Muslims. So they came back, they found out that the gossip they heard was a complete lie. Yeah. So they told the Prophet Wasallam that the country they went to was a safe environment for them to practice Islam. Again, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged his followers to get ready to migrate to Abyssinia. This time, the number grew, and about a hundred plus Muslim men and women with the children got ready to travel to Abyssinia. And so they did. They went there, led by Uthman ibn Affan and Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And they stayed in Abyssinia, practicing their religion, talk, uh, 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 teaching each other, and reading the Quran, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal without anybody interrupting or interfering with what they were doing. It was a new life. Yet it was not that easy, because they were in a strange country. They didn't look like the locals, they didn't speak the language of the locals, and they didn't practice the religion of the locals. So they were completely out of place, but still it was far better than worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal in yes. Mecca it's under another, oppression. It's another kind of testing. Definitely it is a different kind of testing and a difficult one as well. But they did not have any other solution. They tried their best. They tried to call their people with the good word. They tried to tolerate. They tried to ignore the ignorance. They tried to conceal whatever they had without showing it to them. Yet the pagans insisted on finding what they were preaching and why. So they did not leave them any space or room to maneuver. The only choice they had was to flee the country. Yeah. And at the time, the most suitable place was Abyssinia. Abyssinia 
was ruled by Asmaha. This is his name. Yeah. But the position was called an najashi yeah. It's like Caesar or the Tsar or the uh, Heraclius the and so on. So an najashi was at first deprived of his uh, throne because his father, who was the king of Abyssinia, was assassinated by his brother. So he, his, and, and uh, uh, his uncle took a Najashi, Asmaha, and sold him as a slave and who worked as a shepherd. And he assumed his position as the king of Abyssinia. Yeah. And he kept on ruling until he was close to die. And he looked at his sons, and all of them were, you know, retarded. Yeah. None of them was <laughs> worthy of fit, being fit the, enough yeah. to rule. Yeah. So he didn't know what to do, and then he died. So the people started choosing his kids, but none of them was fit to rule. Yeah. So they looked for an Najashi Asmaha, who was a shepherd. And they brought him, and they put him on the throne, and put the crown back on his head and he ruled Abyssinia to be a safe haven for the Muslims. What did the Muslims do? Inshallah, this will be our topic next time we meet. And until then, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.